The great mystic and scholar and theologian, Howard Thurman, said, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Now, for those of you who don't know who Howard Thurman was, he was um, a really a kind of key figure in the development of Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And King used to carry that book around, and King was a student of his while he was at Morehouse. And I start out with this quote to kind of get us spiritually centered for the question that this particular TED Talk theme is putting forth. What now? We're asking that question, what now? Because we find ourselves in a tense and unprecedented situation. Much like King and many of those in the civil rights movement at the time found themselves in. And so I want to kind of take us through some thoughts. Now, I'm a jazz musician, obviously. This is a saxophone, it is not a kazoo. Um, and so I'm going to give you kind of a perspective of by spirit, being spiritually centered there with what Howard Thurman says and puts forth by some of the lessons I've learned as a jazz musician. Now, I think it's first to kind of give you some kind of context for how I come to the music in many respects. My first musical spirit experience, actually, is in the church. Now, I grew up in a small town in, in, in Arkansas called Pine Bluff. And yeah, it sounds like, it is exactly like it sounds. Pine Bluff is a little town um, in southeastern Arkansas. But I remember being at church, at New Hope CME Church. The church is actually a position right behind our house. We could walk through my backyard and through the back gate and walk right into the church. And I was just a little kid. And on this particular day, I remember a particular feeling that came inside of the church. Everybody was singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. before a mega church, right? New Hope was a small little church. So this is before the church had a full rhythm section. It was simply a pianist and the choir and all the souls in that room. And everybody was singing. And this feeling just kind of came over me and I could feel that same feeling basically come over everybody that was sitting inside of that church singing. And I could see Mr. Buck. Mr. Buck was a church elder and I could see him ushering at the door. And he was singing the song and tears were in his eyes. And I could see Miss Peaches, who was an elder mother in the church. And I could see her sitting on the front pew because she was too fragile to really stand up. And she was sitting there and she was swaying back and forth. And I could see Miss Clay over to the other side with her hand raised and proclaiming what a great friend Jesus was. And I started to cry. I understand, I was a little kid, and at the time, I really could not articulate for you why I was crying, but what I did know was this. I knew what so many people in that room were going through. Mr. Buck was fighting cancer. Miss Peaches was very, very, very sickly. And Miss, Miss McCray had just basically lost her job. But in that moment, none of that mattered. 
because it was the power of this song and the power of this music and the way that it brought everybody together that it transcended all of their particular issues. And I was sensing about that day that it stuck with me. And every single time I play my saxophone, I think about that. And that's the feeling I'm trying to get to in the room. Well, fast forward several years later. I'm a freshman in college. And I'm walking the halls. And the band director walks up to me and he says, you're going to be in jazz band. We rehearse Monday, Wednesday, Friday at noon. I'll see you on Wednesday. And he walked away. And here I am, a freshman, and I'm thinking, jazz band. OK, that sounds cool. Now understand, there was never any jazz band in my high school. My first real exposure to jazz was in college. So I said, sure. So I showed up on Wednesday at noon, took my chair. First thing, though, is that he didn't have a little saxophone for me. He had a tenor. The tenor's a little bit large, and he said, you're going to play tenor. Oh, I really don't think I play tenor well, but OK, I'm playing tenor. And so we sit down, and we're playing. Now understand, I have a clue as to how to play any jazz. So everybody in the band is playing, and everybody's swinging, and everybody's playing in the jazz style. And here I am, a little guy from Palm Bluff, Arkansas, sitting there playing my little concert band style saxophone. It was very interesting. It was very sad. But nevertheless, we kept going, and we were playing a particular tune called Scott's Place. I will never forget it by Thad Jones Mel Lewis. So I'm sitting there, and, and I'm playing Scott's Place, and there comes a section in the music where the notes disappear. There are no notes there. There's simply a bunch of letters, a C with a minus, an F with a triangle, all of these kind of hieroglyphic looking things. And so when I got to that spot, I just stopped. I sat there, and I sat in the chair, and I just kind of listened to everybody. Well, oh, they sound real good. And he cut the band off. And he says, why aren't you, why aren't you playing? I said, oh, because all the, all the notes disappeared. All the notes stopped. See, I got letters here. So I, he said, no, those are called chord changes in jazz. We play chord changes. So this opposed a solo. Right on the second tenor solo. A one, two, three, four, bow. Rhythm section pops off, the band pops off, and there I sit. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, there's no notes here. What on, a, what on the planet Earth am I supposed to play? So I don't play anything again. I just sit there. And he cuts the band off again. And he looks at me and he says, I just told you you're supposed to be playing. Why aren't you playing? I just told you because there are no notes on the page. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this. You're supposed to improvise, solo, invent it. Right on the second tenor solo. One, two, three, four, bow. And there I sat again. <laughs> and by this time, he's gotten a bit irritated with me. And he cuts the band off. And he walks over to my chair, and he bends down. And he says, why aren't you playing? Because there are no notes on your page, and I don't know what I'm supposed to play. And he says, what you're supposed to play is here and is here. Now, I don't care what you play, but you play something. Second tenor solo. One, two, three, four, bow! And I put my horn in my mouth, and I played something. I played something. <laughs> and it was extraordinarily sad. <laughs> and he cut the band off. And I knew it was really sad. And he knew it was really sad. And everybody in the band knew that it was very sad. And he just looked at me and went, yeah, that's jazz. <laughs> And I went, no, that's sad. <laughs> um, so after rehearsal, I was, I was extraordinarily embarrassed. I was just like, man, I do not like, I do not want to sound bad. So if you want me to play in this jazz band stuff, you got to give me some help. You got to give me something. So he reached in. I'm going to show you my age for all the young people here. He reaches in his desk, and he gets out a cassette tape. 
for those of you, maybe you know what that is. And he throws me the cassette tape, and he says, now, you take that, and if you learn how to play like that, you'll really be able to play some jazz. That's all I got to do? Yep, that's all you got to do. I said, okay, cool. So I took it back to my dorm room, and I popped this tape in, and I hear something like this. where the head goes, pow. Well, that was me. My head went, pow. Because what I felt when I heard that for me was the same feeling I remembered in New Hope, CME Church, when everybody was singing, what a friend we have in Jesus. So that started me on my jazz journey. Now, the greatest teacher that I have had in life other than my beautiful parents, has been trying to learn how to play this music at the highest level that I possibly can. So I want to just share with you a couple of insights I have from a few people that have left an indelible impression on me. First of all, Duke Ellington. I'm sure many of you have heard of Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington's one of the great composers of any kind of style of music, not just jazz music, but really of any music. But as great as Duke Ellington was, he had somebody who was there with him who helped him in a lot of those compositions that a lot of people have not heard of. And his name is Billy Strayhorn. And Billy Strayhorn was an absolute musical genius. He wrote one of the most highly regarded jazz compositions ever when he was only 16 or 17 years old. It's called Lush Life. But the complexity of the chord structure, the beauty, the haunting, beautiful melody is absolutely breathtaking. Well, he and Ellington had a long um, musical relationship that was so incredibly fruitful. But Strayhorn died. And in his eulogy, Duke Ellington had these four things to say about Billy Strayhorn. Number one that Billy Strayhorn had this, the, the four freedoms, as he called it. And the first freedom was the freedom from hate. Now let me tell you something else about Billy Strayhorn. Billy Strayhorn was an openly African-American gay man in the 1940s. So you can imagine the kind of, the kind of oppression that he had to deal with on a daily basis. But the thing about Mr. Strayhorn was that he never hated. And he said, you have to be free from hate unconditionally. No matter what anybody else does, you can never let hate overtake you. The second was self-pity. You have to be free of self-pity. No matter how tough things got, Billy Strayhorn always was able to keep an upbeat spirit. He was always able to, to, to present himself and the true and his genius through his music. Then there's the freedom from fear. And Duke Ellington was careful to define fear in this kind of way. Freedom from the fear of doing something for somebody else that actually may benefit them more than it benefits you. That gets into our intentionality. But having the intention to live a life that you're not worried about if somebody else does well too. And you're not going to try to do anything, or you're not going to try to set up any kind of system or systems or structures that are going to prohibit them from doing well too. There's enough good for all of us out there. And then finally, the, f the freedom from pride, the kind of pride that makes one think 
that they're better than another man. So the freedom from hate, the freedom from self-pity, the freedom from fear, and the freedom from pride. And that's all something that we can take to heart right now as we try to navigate the crazy terrain that we find ourselves in socially. We have people that won't talk to each other for political reasons. We have more vitriol right now than we've had, at least certainly in my particular lifetime. And if we're going to try to, to mend that in some kind of way or move forward, there's not going to be any going back. We have to try to figure out how to move forward. If we can take those four freedoms, that certainly helps us out. Now, the next person <laughs> is one of the great characters of jazz. His name is Thelonious Monk. Thelonious Sphere Monk. Now, with a name like that, you can imagine he's a character. Now, you already got to know the jazz is full of characters. Duke Ellington, Count Basie, right? You've got all of these royal names and all of these great characters. But Monk was even, even more, <laughs> set himself apart even more than, than many others. Monk would oftentimes show up to a gig, and he would be in a full suit. Even if it was outside and it was 100 degrees outside, Monk would still play in a full suit, buttoned all the way up. He oftentimes wore hats. He wore rings on all his fingers. Monk is a piano player, and he didn't play like a classical pianist. He played flat-fingered. But what Monk taught us, besides his great genius as a musician, was how to be himself. Because Monk said, a genius is the one that is most like himself. A genius is the one who is most like himself. So what does that tell us? It tells us that every single person in this room, every single person that's listening to me, we all have genius. Every single one of us. But we have to go in there and get it. The genius isn't outside of us. Nobody can tell us our genius. The genius was given to us the second that we were thought about and brought here. And we've got to take the responsibility to go in there and to get that genius. Now, the last thing that I'll leave you with is the tune called Ugly Beauty. Now, this is a composition by Monk. And as I was thinking about what I possibly could talk about for this, I thought about the idea of life as we have it and know it and understand it now. And quite frankly, it's ugly. But at the same time, it's infinitely beautiful. It's infinitely beautiful because we actually have an opportunity to make decisions from here on right now that honor the four freedoms, that honor the humanity in one another, that see the best in each other and call it forth, but we have to do that. And we have to know that that's not easy. I'm not trying to say that any of this is easy. Trying to, trying to live from your highest place is one of the hardest things that you're ever going to do. But if we're actually going to move to where we really want to be, we have to take that chance. And we have to have that courage. And we have to be spiritually centered in it. And we have to get our intentions straight. So I'm going to play this tune, and I just want you, everybody, to take a minute to just use this as a reflective tune. And I want you to take a minute to close your eyes and go deep inside yourself and ask yourself, what is my genius? And how am I using my genius in fear from fear, and freedom from fear, freedom from self-pity, freedom from pride, and freedom from hate? And how am I making this better?
Thank you.